So now we have our heliocentric model um, by Copernicus. And now the task that fell to astronomers is figuring out um, what laws, what mathematical and physical laws govern the motion of these bodies. So um, basically I said that Ptolemy's model had a bunch of complicated math to predict the motions of the planets. So what math predicts the motions of the planets in this new system? So this brings us to another astronomer of historical notability, and that would be Johannes Kepler. So if we say Copernicus is now at the top of our new astronomy timeline, um, we have Galileo and Hans Lippershey, the inventor of the telescope. So this spans from about the 1400s to the 1600s. Um, there's also this fellow Tycho Brahe, um, who is a nobleman. He's like the son of rich parents. Uh, he gets a fancy observatory built and he just goes to his fancy observatory and um, watches the planets and other things as well. Um, but but uh, Tycho is just like nuts for data. And so he is, you know, cataloging all of his observations just obsessively and amasses this wealth of information. Um, but he's not very good at math. So he is, doesn't <laughs> really have anything to do with all this data. So he hires a um, assistant and that assistant is Johannes Kepler. All right, so Johannes Kepler comes along, he's Tycho's assistant and his job is to figure out what are the equations that govern planetary motion. And so Kepler is using Tycho's data but Tycho doesn't give it to Kepler all at once because he's afraid that he'll figure it out too fast and steal all the glory. So he doles it out very slowly. And so it's not until after Tycho's death that Kepler is able to get all of the data at once, which is what he needs to be able to come up with his laws. Uh, he publishes his three laws of motion in Astronomia Nova in 1609. Um, Tycho's a weird fellow. I think eventually his nose got removed somehow and then he replaced it with one made of lead. Anyway, read about Tycho, he's a weird, weird fellow. All right. So um, this Astronomia Nova, this happened just before um, the observations by Galileo with the telescope. So all of this is happening like at once. So it must have been a really exciting time to be working on astronomy. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Kepler's work and what he did. So he had all of Tycho's data and essentially what he had was this table of observations, just numbers upon numbers, right? He had the dates that Tycho was observing, the position of the sun on the sky, right? The right ascension and declination of the sun and the right ascension and declination of all the planets. So let's use Mars uh, just as an example. So, um, you can use all these numbers to plot out the position of the sun relative to the earth and also of Mars relative to the earth, right? So if you want to draw out this observation, it would look something like this. The sun is in whatever location it's in and Mars is in the other location. And if you account for the motion of the sun properly, then you can get just how, much, how far Mars moved relative to earth and sun. So that's what Kepler's math was um, aimed at accomplishing. And so the idea is that you would want to plot out the position of Mars in a bunch of different locations um, for different dates, and in this way, trace out its entire orbit. And so that's what Kepler did, um, traced out the orbit of the planets. And um, in Copernicus's model, all the orbits were circles. Um, but this is clearly not a circle. So this was Kepler's big discovery is that planets do not move in circles. That's why Copernicus's model was not very good at predicting the locations of the planets in the sky. Instead, planets orbit in ellipses. All right, so Kepler's laws, a huge contribution to astronomy.
um, there's three laws. So I'm going to talk about two, and then you'll do an activity to sort of see the third in action to construct it for yourself. So the first law is just what we noticed um, from the previous slide. Um, planets orbit in ellipses, and their star is at one focus. Um, this first law doesn't only govern the orbits of planets, it also holds true for moons, for comets, for asteroids, etc. So if for a moon, the planet is at one focus. Okay, there are some special um, points on an elliptical orbit. Perihelion is the point of closest approach to the sun, and aphelion is the furthest point from the sun. So because you know the sun is not centered in the orbit, then there's uh, the orbit has different distances to the sun throughout the year. And um, what's the deal with these focuses, right? These foci of the ellipse. Well, an ellipse has two focuses. This is how you can construct an ellipse if you tie a piece of string to one focus and the other focus and have a little bit of slack in it. Then if you pull it tight with a pencil and trace out, keeping the string tight, you'll, you'll trace out an ellipse. So these two focuses, um, they're what defines the, the mathematical shape of that ellipse. Um, if the focuses are farther apart, then we say that that shape is more elliptical. And if the focuses are closer together, then we say it's less elliptical. Um, the, these are also really important because the distance from one focus to the edge of the ellipse and then back to the other focus is always the same. That's why the, the string and pencil trick works. So what that looks like is, you know, if we if we brought that string and pencil to any point, um, the total distance would be the same because the length of the string couldn't change. So mathematically, this is what ellipses are. Um, there's some key properties that we wanna be aware of and that we'll talk about. Um, the first is, well, how do we measure the, the geometry of the ellipse? Um, the semi-major axis is the point from the middle of the ellipse to the edge. The semi-minor axis is the short way. So the semi-major axis is the long way from the center to the edge, and the semi-minor is the short way from the middle to the edge. Um, the focus distance is measured from the center to the focus. We won't use that very much. For the most part, we'll talk about semi-major axis when we talk about an ellipse. So this is the one to, to, be, to pay attention to, this blue line from the center to the edge, the long way. And then um, using these, we can calculate the eccentricity of an ellipse. And that's given by the focus distance divided by the semi-major axis. Um, I, will, I will never ever have you use this equation, so don't worry about it. But I do want you to see what eccentricities look like. So let me try to show you that. So a, a circle is the least elliptical shape you can have. But then you can imagine if you squash out an ellipse farther and farther, eventually it'll become a straight line. And that's as eccentric as any, any ellipse could possibly get. Okay, it's not clear looking at this equation how this works out to me. But again, let's not worry about this equation. Okay, let me show you a series of different eccentricities. So this one is eccentricity zero, that's our circle. Here's eccentricity of 0.5. So now my focus distance is half of the distance to the semi-major axis. And as we get larger and larger, then the ratio of focus to semi-major axis gets longer and longer. All right, so lower eccentricity circle, longer eccentricity, more squashed. Okay. But it is interesting to think about what is the eccentricity of different planetary orbits, right? Um, on the last slide, we saw that, you know, the, the first ellipse that we drew after the circle was eccentricity of 0.5. All the planetary orbits have fairly low eccentricity. Mercury and Pluto are about 0.2, and everything else is about 0.01 to 0.06. So, Let's have a little poll. Um, looking at these 
two circles that I've drawn. One of them is a circle, a perfect circle, and the other one is the orbit of Pluto. So that's about how eccentric the most eccentric orbits in our solar system are. So um, this is just kind of a guessing game, but which one do you think is the orbit of Pluto? Pretty much a 50-50 split with this vote, which is what I would expect. So it turns out that um, this green one is Pluto and this blue one is a perfect circle. They look pretty much the same to my eye, yeah? Um, so the eccentricity of even the most eccentric orbits in our solar system is pretty minimal. Everything is almost perfectly circular. So if we overlap them, they look almost the same, but you can almost, you can kind of see the difference between Pluto's orbit and the perfect circle here. All right, so Pluto's orbit is a little bit eccentric. It's a little bit squished, um, but not terribly so. All right, so um, how far exactly from being perfectly circular are the different orbits? So if we look at our semi-major axis and semi-minor axis, for circle, those would be the exact same. So if we assumed that the semi-major axis of all of these orbits was one mile, which it's not, but let's just say that it was one mile, how much would the semi-minor axis be shorter by? Um, for Mercury and Pluto, it would be relatively considerable, 100 or so feet. Um, but for the Earth, it would only be eight inches. So eight inches difference from one mile, not a very big difference. All right, so just another way to think about how the eccentricity of the planets isn't very large. Okay, so I told you that there are two focuses, foci, of an ellipse. So um, the sun is at one of the focuses for the orbits of the planets, but what's at the other focus? Yeah, vast majority of you voting for option number two. That's exactly right. There's nothing special at the other focus. It's just a mathematical fact that ellipses have two focuses. Um, but mathematically, while there's another focus, there doesn't have to be anything going on there. So the sun is at one focus, and that's it. It's just the gravity between the sun and the planet that keeps the planet in orbit around the sun. Um, so it doesn't depend on anything being at that other focus. We'll talk more about gravity next week. Okay, one other question. Let's say we have two planets that have the same semi-major axis. So they both have the same uh, semi-major axis in their ellipse, but planet A has a larger eccentricity than planet B. So um, which planet would have a shorter perihelion distance? And let me remind you, perihelion is the distance from the planet to the sun at its closest approach. And I am now seeing many more votes for option number one than any other option. Um, and that is exactly right. So planet A would have the shorter perihelion distance. Again, I don't think it's easy to reason about this unless you actually draw a picture. So I am also going to explain this by pictures. So if we say planet A and planet B have the same semi-major axis, that means that the distance between the center of the ellipse and the edge of the ellipse has to be the same for both. So here I'm showing the situation if they had the same semi-major axis and the same eccentricity. Um, but if planet B has a smaller eccentricity, it means its orbit looks less squashed than planet A, meaning I need to make planet B's orbit look a bit more circular while keeping that distance between its center and its edge the same, right? So now we have the same semi-major axis, but different eccentricities. And if I think about where the focuses are, the focuses are farther apart for larger eccentricities. So if they're farther apart for planet A than they are for planet B, then that means that if we um, kind of overlap them and think about, um, you know, if we put their focuses at the same point, then it's closer to the edge of the ellipse for planet A than it is for planet B. All right, so there they are again separated. If I wanted to measure the distance from this green dot to the edge, or same from the black dot to the edge, then it would be shorter for planet A, meaning its perihelion would be shorter. So this is just an example of, you know, if, we, if there's a closer perihelion, that's a, a, that could have consequences for a planet's, um, how much 
radiation it receives from the sun at different points during its orbit. So it can have effects on um, a planet's surface conditions. And this is why we care about the shapes of planetary orbits. Okay. There's lots of other things that affect the surface conditions of a planet, and we'll get into all of those in this class. So Kepler's third, our first law is simply that planets orbit in ellipses, and there is the sun at one focus of that ellipse. Um, and as we just saw, um, the eccentricity of an elliptical orbit affects where the perihelion distance is for different planets. So Kepler's second law um, kind of shows one of the consequences of those differences. And that is, if there is a line between the star and the planet, and we look at the planet orbiting in a set amount of time, then that line will sweep out equal areas in equal times. So as an example, if I start on December 1st in my orbit, these arrows are pointing the wrong way, and I go through two full months, um, then I end up sweeping out this green area in the ellipse. On the other hand, if I'm at the other end of my orbit, closer to aphelion, and I start on June 1st, and I also let my planet orbit for two months, then I sweep out this yellow area of the ellipse. And both of those areas are equal, even though they are a completely different shape, right? So like the same amount of pizza is in each one, but the slices are a totally different shape. So this equal area in equal time has a consequence. Uh, which is that the planets um, traverse different lengths of their orbit in those times. So if I'm in the same amount of time going a short distance at, around aphelion and a larger distance around perihelion, that means I'm actually swinging around the star fastest during perihelion. So that means that the speed of a planet in its orbit is not constant throughout the year. So before I tell you about Kepler's third law, there's a graphing activity I would like you to do. Um, so when we plotted just the semi-major axis versus the period of all these different objects on the left graph, then it kind of looks like this curve shape, right? Like some kind of parabolic sort of shape. Um, but when you calculate the semi-major axis cubed and the period squared, and then plot those on the graph on the right, then you get something that looks pretty much like a straight line, right? So um, this is what we mean when we say that Kepler's third law is a law of proportionality between period squared and semi-major axis cubed. The period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed, and that is why all of those bodies line up on a straight line here. Here we go. So this is what that proportionality law looks like in mathematical form. So we say the square of the period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed, p squared proportional to a cubed. Um, this funny looking symbol is, it just means is proportional to. And so remember a is the semi-major axis and p, the orbital period is the time that it takes to complete one full orbit. And so what this proportionality symbol gives us, if we use period in years and we use semi-major axis measured in AU, then um, this proportionality becomes exactly equal to. So we'll use the mathematics of this next week with gravity, but for now it's enough to say um, the proportionality means that if the semi-major axis goes up, if we have a larger orbit, then the period goes up. It takes longer to make that orbit. So this is the, the key observation here. Larger orbits take longer. And that is the, this is, this is it, the law that governs planetary orbits.